Α περάσουμε στο τελευταίο μα θέμα για απόψε. Την 5η 25 Οκτωβρίου έλαβε χώρα στο Hellenic Center η διάλεξη με θέμα Θεσσαλονίκη 26 Οκτωβρίου 1912, 100 years from the liberation of Macedonia. Η εκδήλωση διοργανώθηκε από την Ένωση Μακεδόνων Μεγάλης Βρετανίας και ο πρόεδρος εταιρείας Ελλήνων Μακεδόνων, κ. Φίλιππος Μαυροσκούφης, παρουσίασε τον κύριο μιλητή, τον καθηγητή Κωνσταντίνο Βακαλόπουλο, που θα τον παρακολουθήσουμε αμέσως τώρα. We're about to start. Your Excellencies, Your Eminence, Members and Friends of the Macedonian Society, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Tomorrow, is the 100th anniversary of the liberation of Thessaloniki from centuries of Ottoman rule. On the 26th of October, the commander of the Ottoman forces, Taksim Pasha, surrendered the city to the commander-in-chief of the Greek army, the then Crown Prince. The significance of the event for the city, for its diverse population, for its development and its rise to Balkan Megalopolis will be the subject of tonight's event. The Spanish philosopher, George Santayana, had once famously remarked that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It was also Eric, Eric Hobsbawm, the distinguished historian who died last month, who said that it is the business of historians to remember the things that other people forget. Of course, people do forget. People often have their history manipulated, massaged or altered altogether, either for political purposes or for nation-building purposes. From the time of Herodotus and Thucydides, historians had to perform a remarkable service to humankind. That of collecting systematically and methodically through many filters of objectivity material in order to form and live a truthful record of events. And yet, interpretation of historical events is also very important so that causes can be analyzed, motives can be explained, conclusions be drawn, and perhaps going back to Santayana, lessons be learned. It also helps if those historians come up with a nice story. Historically, some of the great historians have also been very great storytellers. Similarly, the world of literature is full of great storytellers who through beautiful narrative have brought alive a whole historical period depicting social, political and personal realities of the place and of the period in a way that perhaps a historian does not feel permitted to attempt. Tonight we have a double bill of lectures. We have a historian from the academic field and we have a very well-known novelist. Talking about double bill and Thessaloniki in the same context, I cannot help but nostalgically reminisce back 40 or 50 years to that era of cinematic double bills in the city's traditional cinema hall. So I don't know if, I'm sure that there are some people who come from Thessaloniki who remember that era. There must be plenty of you here who have similar memories. But let me not digress any further. The time is precious tonight, and I promise not to succumb to any further digressions. So, our first speaker tonight is Professor Konstantinos Vakalopoulos. He was born in Thessaloniki in 1951. Sorry for diverging your age. Uh, he is the son of, a, of another great historian, Professor, uh, the late Professor Apostolos Vakalopoulos, who has left a, uh, an era in, in, in the University of Thessaloniki and, the, uh, and, and history studies. He was educated thank you, at the German School of Thessaloniki and then from 1969 at the Philosophy School of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. He then uh, continued his studies on uh, graduate level in Geneva. And as you can see from the uh, CV that we left on, on your seats, 
Uh, he spent a couple of years there in, in, uh, in the University of Geneva and he studied uh, the historical archives at the Canton de Genève uh, and he focused particularly in, uh, um, in the study of uh, of, the, of Swiss philhellenism. There, apparently there, there were very important city archives that he dealt with and uh, he found material that had not been published uh, um, until then. He then went, uh, went on to write his doctoral thesis uh, uh, on the subject of relations between Hellenes and Swiss philhellenes during the, 19, 20, uh, the 1821 Greek War of Independence. Later, in 1976, he spent some time here in London uh, at the Berbeck College, uh, just further up near uh, University College, under the tutelage of Professor Douglas Dakin, a highly respected scholar in the field of Neo-Hellenic history. During 10 years of fruitful work at the Institute of Balkan Studies in Thessaloniki, he focused on the study of Balkan history, with particular emphasis in the study of those remote Balkan areas where Greek populations coexisted with other uh, Balkan ethnic groups. In 1986, he was elected professor uh, at the Chair of Modern Greek History at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Throughout his academic career, he has produced a very high volume of uh, very important work, original studies, and many publications in uh, international journals. He attended numerous uh, conferences and congresses around the world, and he contributed to a multi-volume uh, work, The History of the Hellenic Nation, with a section in, on the period of the anarchy, 1831 to 1833, if I'm not wrong, uh, Costas, in the, work, in the War of Independence. The epicenter of Professor Vakalopoulos' work is a deep and analytical study of Balkan realities, but his aim is to continue to contrib contribute to better understanding of Balkan history and to peaceful coexistence of Balkan peoples. And don't we need that? Before I ask Professor Vakaropoulos to come to the podium, I would like to thank uh, a few people uh, our, uh, who sponsored this event. I would like to thank the London Executive for uh, putting a lot of effort and uh, resources uh, for the success of this event. Uh, the Kensington Close Hotel for providing hospitality for our uh, first speaker. I also want to congratulate our new ambassador here in London. Uh, welcome and we wish you all success at a very difficult time in your uh, duties. Thank you very much. Στη συνέχεια στο βήμα ανέβηκε ο καθηγητής κύριος Βακαλόπουλος, ο οποίος έκανε μια ιστορική αναδρομή από το 1912 έως και σήμερα. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε ένα απόσπασμα από την ομιλία του. Dear ladies and gentlemen, on the occasion of today's event, I would like to thank you warmly for the honor the Macedonian Society of Great Britain and to President Dr. Philippos Mavroskoufis has bestowed on me by inviting to speak on the 100 years since the liberation of Thessaloniki, the capital city of Macedonia. In addition, I would like to express my warm regards to the Hellenic Center of London for hosting today's event. This year, it is 100 years since the liberation of Hellenic Macedonia and, of course, of the city of Thessaloniki. Memory is renewed through tradition and consolidated by the historical background and the ongoing research. The historical continuity is ensured through the long-term study of the region and is generally reflected in terms of the critical review of the times. Thessaloniki is the only seaboard city of contemporary Greece that has never, from its foundation till today, lost its commercial importance. And this is because it is located in the most favorable geographical position in Macedonia, in the place where it can most suitably unite the hinterland with the sea and develop a lively commerce between them. No other place on the Macedonian coast offers the advantages 
which this inmost recess of the Thermaic Gulf possesses. Thessaloniki was founded at the beginning of a great new era in the history of ancient Greece and in more, in more general terms of mankind, the so-called Hellenistic age. In that epoch, after the conquest of Alexander the Great, Greek civilization was spread and expanded to almost all the then known world. The, this prodigious expansion and penetration of Hellenism into the far distant lands of the East, those lands of dream and fable gave great impetus to the development of the ancient world. The world thus newly created produced new needs which had to be supplied, it was then that at appropriate points on the great trade routes, great urban centers in which the new life pulsated, were founded or developed. Two in particular became distinguished, Antioch and Alexandria, cities which connected Mesopotamia and India with the Mediterranean. The need was certainly perceived at this time also for close contact between Macedonia and the far distant lands comprising the state of the successors of Alexander the Great. Thessaloniki was founded, or rather was colonized, colonized in 316, that is when King Cassander took as his wife Thessaloniki, the sister of Alexander the Great. At that moment, to do her honor, he gave her name to the new city. The splendid geographical situation of Thessaloniki ensured the city great progress and development with the passage <coughs> of the years. Thessaloniki quickly attracted and absorbed many inhabitants of the small towns round about. Ships from every corner of the Aegean, from the coasts of Syria, Phoenicia and Egypt, and from other parts, unloaded the products of foreign lands in her harbor. Not only did foreign relig religious penetrate into Thessaloniki at a very early date, but also various people who resided in the East must have settled there on a temporary or even on a permanent basis, attracted by the commerce of Thessaloniki, which became very vigorous year by year and predominantly surely were the Jews. So speedy was the development of Thessaloniki that already in the second century it was a great city with a ring of walls crowned by a spacious and renowned acropolis. In Hellenistic times, Thessaloniki had two levels of administration, just as other Greek cities had. A democratic government with a parliament, Vuli, an assembly of the people, Ecclesia to Dimu, and its own civic <coughs> officials, Politiki. The fierce and lengthy wars between Perseus and Romans terminated in the decisive battle of Pydra, 168, in which the Macedonian king was totally defeated. The Romans did not incorporate Macedonia in the Roman possessions, but they divided the country into four sectors, four autonomous districts. Although the Roman yoke was unbearable, thereby provoking several rebellions, Thessaloniki was named a free city thanks to its position of privilege and so continued to have a parliament and an assembly of the people. However, with the policy of centralization adopted by Romans, the popular assembly lost power. Political, social and intellectual life in Thessaloniki was profound and very interesting. With the spread of Christianity, Thessaloniki was to take a prominent place in Christendom. It had the great good fortune and honor of receiving the Apostle Paul and of hearing the gospel of love from his lips. During the period when Galerius resided in Thessaloniki, it is believed that St. Demetrius, who was descended from a ruling family in the city, suffered martyrdom there. As a young man, he had enlisted in the Roman army and had amazing success in his military career. But he had been converted to Christianity and his religious zeal so intense that he used to preach Christianity. After the visit of the Apostle Paul, the greatest event in Christian Thessaloniki was the death by martyrdom of St. Demetrius. 
the great Christian tradition of the city began to be formed. The Seth's cult, in particular, was to become the most marked characteristic of the religious life of the inhabitants. Thessaloniki, and this was to provide the city's own particular characteristics in the future, was to become a great religious center, the city of Demetrius. In all of this, the Byzantine inhabitants and the writers about the city were to take great pride. Byzantine Thessaloniki, with its great abundance of monuments and with its dramatic history of struggles against numer numerous different invaders, is more near to our hearts. The existence of its Byzantine monuments suggests even today the splendor of a center of civilization. And in fact, Thessaloniki constitutes a real museum where one can study representative stages in Byzantine uh, art. However, after the accession of uh, Justinian to the throne, other more fearsome invaders appeared as successors to the gods, the Arabs and the Slavs. Thessaloniki found itself at times in a condition of continual siege by reason of the inroads of the Slav tribes which had established themselves in the neighborhood of the Strimon River. The end of the wars was marked not only by an enormous prosperity of the city, but also by the fact that the Thessalonica brothers, Constantine, Siri, and Methodius, were enabled in the 9th century by their knowledge of the Slav language to propagate Christianity and Byzantine civilization to the Slavs of the Balkans. Those two missionaries, observes the French historian Rambo, brought the Slavs into the family of civilized European nations. To them, the Slavs owe their church, their alphabet, and their literature. In the meantime, the picture of prosperity which Thessaloniki presented during the following centuries was bloated by several invasions, and the heroic resistance against the Saracens 904, the Bulgarian Tsar Simeon and Samuel, and the Normans who appeared before the city in 1185. The capture and plundering of Thessaloniki was an important event for its fate and prepared the next step as a capital of a Frankish kingdom till 1224 and under Greek rulers till 1246. However, in the first half of the 14th century, Thessaloniki emerged as an important intellectual and artistic center. It was a brilliant focal point for Greek studies with the presence of famous scholars as Kumnos, Magistros, Kidonis, Armenopoulos, and many others. These scholars observed and experienced the social problems of their age. They took an interest in the poor and in the betterment of the condition of the rural population. Their ideas were not confined to the narrow circle Thessaloniki, but spread outside the city of the city walls to other centers of the East also, especially to Constantinople, a city with which they were in close contact. Στη συνέχεια της εκδήλωσης, η κυρία Νατάσας Βετζούρη παρουσίασε τη διάσημη συγγραφέα Βικτόρια Χίσλοπ. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε την παρουσίαση. Journalist and writer Victoria Hister. Victoria was born in Kent, read English at St. Hilda's College, Oxford, later worked in book publishing and then in public relations. In 1990, Victoria began working as a freelance journalist, a career which gave her the opportunity to travel all over the world, enabling her to gain experiences and learn different cultures and ways of living. Victoria was the newcomer of the year at the Galaxy British Book Awards 2007 and also won the Richard and Judy Summer Read Competition. A trip to the former leopard colony on the island of Spinaloka in Crete resulted in her first novel, The Island, which was published in 2006 and sold over a million copies in the UK and more than two million copies worldwide. Her third book, The Thread, published in 2011, is the best-seller novel that spans nearly 100 years of history of the city of Thessaloniki, Greece. 
When she first visited Thessaloniki, the vibrancy of the city inspired her and made her research the history of the city. The result of that inspiration and research is the thread, which is a magnificent story of love and friendship that endures through the cat catastrophes and upheavals of the 20th century, from the Great Fire in 1917 to the Civil War and later to the German occupation. <coughs> Victoria makes the city of Thessaloniki internationally known as a place worthy of a visit. Also, with this book, Victoria allows the reader to see beyond Greece's current troubles. Victoria visits Greece very often, has many Greek friends, loves Greek food, is learning Greek, but most of all, Victoria is a great philelin. Tonight, Victoria will present her personal view of finding inspiration in Thessaloniki, turning in fact into fiction. Τελευταία στο βήμα ανέβηκε η διάσημη συγγραφέα Βικτόρια Χίσλοπ, η οποία έκανε μια ομιλία για την πόλη τη Θεσσαλονίκη μέσα από τι δικέ τη εμπειρίε. Α παρακολουθήσουμε ένα απόσπασμα από την ομιλία τη. Speaking Greek, but I think it would be much less painful for all of us. Thank you so much for the great honour of the Society for inviting me um, to speak tonight. And it's slightly strange to come and talk about a city that I first visited only five years ago, um, which seems extraordinary actually to me because it became an obsession for me, this wonderful city. Um, so it's I'm very much a newcomer to Thessaloniki, um, so I hope my observation and my, my love for it doesn't necessarily reflect the sort of brevity of the time I've known it. Um, interestingly, although I've been going to Greece for nearly 30 years when I first went to Thessaloniki, um, my first glimpses of that city were not very favourable. I'm very very honest with you, it wasn't love at first sight by any means at all. And I'd had a very different experience when I went to Athens in the 70s um, and really loved that city immediately. But I remember very distinctly um, looking out of the aeroplane window as I was coming in to land in Thessaloniki um, and not really recognising this as the Greece that I knew. It looked very organised with all the sort of fields laid out, much wetter and much um, more fertile, really, than, than the land I knew as Greece. Um, and then when I, I arrived there, the first thing I did was go to the university campus, probably yours, <laughs> Professor, and I was rather shocked. Um, I've now come to understand why this university um, was covered in graffiti. It seemed very different from the place where I'd been educated in Oxford, whereas if you had written your initial on a wall, you'd been sent down. But clearly, in Thessaloniki, these kind of passionate uh, political views were welcomed um, on the walls. Um, but I felt myself rather alarmed by this, and I thought, what kind of city have I come to? Um, but the next day, I gave, I was there to actually speak at the university to talk to a class of creative writing students um, who wanted to know how I'd written the island and why. Anyway, so I, I delivered my, my talk. And can you hear me? Well, is that you oh, oh, can now. I'm not going to start again. <laughs> I'll get on to the bit where I fell in love with Thessaloniki, so if you missed the fact that I didn't like it at all on that first glimpse, um, you will be forgiven. Anyway, the, the following day, I had one more day in Thessaloniki before I had to return to London. And like any travel writer, as I used to be, I went for a walk to try and explore this city. And of course, what I saw was an extraordinary, for me, a very extraordinary combination of every different period of history. Um, and I can't actually think of many places where, in the space of a 10-minute walk, you would see 
Roman architecture, where you see Byzantine, where you see Art Deco, um, and then of course, even close to the city, the sort of 1970s apartment blocks that maybe the Greeks among you, perhaps a lot of you live in, in, in places like that in Thessaloniki, but I know a lot of British people find all those very identical blocks of flats slightly um, unattractive, but I even found those rather appealing and I wondered what sort of people lived in Thessaloniki. There were two very specific things that I saw that day um, that perhaps made the most impact on me and really kind of ignited my interest and told me, told me that within in a space of literally those few hours that I would need to write about this place. Um, and those were, first of all, the house on Ayupavlu Street, uh, which was the birthplace of, of Mustafa Kemal. Um, at that point, and it sounds kind of, I'm embarrassed almost to admit it, but even five years ago, I had never really understood or even looked into the relationship between Turkey and Greece. Um, and that visit to Kemal Ataturk's house um, basically opened up that story to me. For a start, I was the only person in the house. That, that was puzzling. Um, and I think it's changed now, but at the time when I went, the sign on the outside um, was in Turkish and English. I don't think then it was even in Greek. So I was a little bit mystified. Um, I sort of got my, they let me in and I handed in my passport. Again, I found that mysterious. Um, and then I started to talk to the custodian in my then rather primitive Greek. Um, and he wasn't having, or didn't understand, a word of it. Um, and he spoke back to me in English and I was a little bit put out because I was rather dying to practice my, my Greek. But I understood then that he was Turkish He did not want to speak Greek to me. Εδώ να σας αναφέρουμε πως ολόκληρη την εκδήλωση θα την παρακολουθήσετε προσεχώς στο Hellenic TV. Να σας υπενθυμίσουμε ότι μπορείτε να επικοινωνείτε μαζί μας τηλεφωνικά στο 020 8292 7037 ή μέσω της ηλεκτρονικής μας διεύθυνσης info at hellenictv.net. Και μην ξεχνάτε ότι πλέον μπορείτε να παρακολουθήσετε από το κανάλι 225 στα Φρύβιου τις αγαπημένες σας ελληνικές και κυπριακές σειρές και τις τοπικές παραγωγές του σταθμού μας, αλλά και κινηματογραφικές ταινίες μέσω της πλατφόρμας του Hellenic TV που περιλαμβάνει 14 ελληνικά κανάλια από Ελλάδα και Κύπρο. Το Hellenic TV πάντα πρωτοπορεί σε διάφορα θέματα τεχνολογίας και πλέον έχετε τη δυνατότητα να παρακολουθείτε όλα τα κανάλια της πλατφόρμας του Hellenic TV και στα κινητά σας τηλέφωνα. Α δούμε τώρα τι εκδηλώσει των επόμενων ημερών. Αύριο Σάββατο θα πραγματοποιηθεί ο καθιερωμένο περιφερειακό χορό του ΑΚΕΛ Μεγάλη Βρετανία στο Κυπριακό Κοινοτικό Κέντρο, όπου θα παρευρεθούν ο Γενικό Γραμματέα του ΑΚΕΛ, άνδρος Κυπριανού και υποψήφιο πρόεδρο Σταύρο Μαλά. Επίση, στον ίδιο χώρο, τη Δευτέρα, 12 Νοεμβρίου, ο υποψήφιο πρόεδρο Σταύρο Μαλά θα πραγματοποιήσει προεκλογική συγκέντρωση στι 7.45. Την 5η 15 Νοεμβρίου, η Εθνική Κυπριακή Ομοσπονδία Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου διοργανώνει αντικατοχική πικετοφορία έξω από την τουρκική πρεσβεία. Η διαδήλωση θα ξεκινήσει στις 6 και θα ολοκληρωθεί στις 8 και μισή. Να είστε όλοι εκεί. Αμέσως μετά ακολουθούν οι ταινίες «Τρία πουλάκια κάθονται» και «Πίσω πόρτα». Τα προγράμματα που μπορείτε να παρακολουθήσετε το Σαββατοκύριακο είναι Αύριο Σάββατο στις 7.30 την εκπομπή Ανέσπερον Φως που παρουσιάζει και επιμελείται ο πρωτοπρεσβύτερος Σάββας Δαβίδ Βασιλιάδης ενώ στις 8 ακολουθεί εκπομπή με το φακό του Hellenic TV όπου παρουσιάζει ολόκληρη την εκδήλωση του συνδέσμου Λαπίθου Καραβά «Ο χορός του Λεμονιού». Επίσης την Κυριακή παρακολουθήστε στις 7.30 τη λογοτεχνική εκπομπή του Hellenic TV Τεχνόπολης με την Άννα Κωστοπούλου ενώ στις 8 ακολουθεί εκπομπή πρόσωπα με τον Βασίλη Παναγή. Τέλος, την Τετάρτη 14 Νοεμβρίου, μην ξεχάσετε να παρακολουθήσετε την εκπομπή με το φακό του Hellenic TV με θέματα εγγένεια και ο αγιασμός της νέας αίθουσας του οικοευγυρίας Autumn Gardens. Στο σημείο αυτό, η εκπομπή Ομογένεια εδώ Λονδίνο έχει φτάσει στο τέλος της και σας ευχαριστούμε που ήσασταν μαζί μας και απόψε. Εμείς ανανεώνουμε το ραντεβού μας για την επόμενη Παρασκευή, 16 Νοεμβρίου, στις 8.30 το βράδυ. Μέχρι τότε σας ευχόμαστε να έχετε ένα καλό Σαββατοκύριακο και καλή εβδομάδα. Καλό σας βράδυ.